Fireside, and it is nice to be with you all in our various formats this morning. I am wearing the robe that my grandmother gifted me for the first time today uh, after uh, becoming a officially licensed minister through the New Haven Association. I'm thankful for them to grant me that, and uh, also our uh, first Sunday that we are officially allowing a couple people to come into church. Uh, I'd like to be celebrating that uh, with uh, this, well, with this uh, next step. And I'm really thankful for my grandmother for gifting me uh, this very special gift on my graduation from the seminary. So I'd like to recognize that, and I always remember her when I use it during services. We have a few announcements this morning. As I have mentioned, our church will now uh, be open but with limitations. And when I say that, I do strongly encourage people to continue to remain home and continue to take advantage of the virtual formats that we have available in order to stay safe. Uh, if you do come into church, masks should be worn over your full face. Abide by the signs in the pews as to where to sit, and no singing or minimal singing, depending on how many people we have involved, uh, and no uh, uh, and reason to be active in the kitchen on Sundays, and the temperature will be taken, and your name will be taken as you walk in at the east entrance. Again, uh, I do strongly encourage those to remain safe at home 
as we continue to worship. If you would like to serve as a liturgist, please contact me as well uh, so we can start integrating liturgy uh, and other uh, participants back into the services. Also, if you would like to be visiting, I have not reached out to you yet, or if I have, or regardless, uh, if you'd like to be visited, please reach out to me to let me know. I have been doing my best to reach out to everyone. However, I have recognized that I have not made all the connections uh, to this point, and I'd like to continue doing that, and I'm continuing to strive to do my best. But please uh, contact me if you're feeling like you would appreciate a visit or a phone call or anything right now. I will be here for you. I would also like to recognize that Dave Borden has taken the aluminum and received $45 to give to the church's wider mission fund. So thank you to Dave for uh, organizing that and collecting those aluminums. Also, if you would like to, me to read the name of your loved one on All Saints Day, also please contact me with the name of your loved one. Uh, if you've had anyone who's passed within the past year, since last November 1st, I would love to include their name. Uh, I have some names uh, already. Please let me know uh, if you have a name that would like to be included. And now let us begin our worship with this morning's call to community. Come away from the valleys of misplaced loyalty. Come seeking to meet the God of all worlds. We have come to praise God and give thanks. We believe God's steadfast love endures forever. We come together that our faith might be strengthened. We seek the strength to live by all we profess. God's awesome deeds saved our ancestors. Surely God's steadfast love continues with us. God continues to deliver us in times of distress. God's steadfast love endures forever. We rejoice that God is near and available to us. We hear God welcoming us to this time of worship and prayer. Our first hymn this morning is God of Earth and Sea and Heaven, found in our Red Books, number 195.
Let us confess our brokenness, for God is merciful and just and will forgive our sin. Let us pray. We do not like to be reminded of our sin, O oh God. We prefer to think of ourselves as decent and good and easy to get along with. Yet when we are confronted by your holiness, we know how inadequate we are and how far short we fall. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us to live in constant remembrance of your glory. That way we shall keep our own lives in order and witness to your love and mercy through Jesus Christ. Amen. Rejoice, knowing that God is always near. Our thanksgiving and our supplications are always heard. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You are chosen by God to share in the minds of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. children within this morning. It is October, and that means there are only two and a half months until Christmas. Are you beginning to think about what you may want for Christmas? Will you still be happy if you do not get what you want? There are some letters in the Bible written by a man named Paul. Paul had been arrested and put in prison or jail even though he had not been found guilty of breaking any law. While he was in prison, he wrote letters to people, to the church, in a place called Philippi. Do you think that Paul was happy for something, or for being in jail for something that he did not do? In his letters, Paul wrote about a secret that he had learned. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. Can you imagine being happy even when something bad or sad happens? Paul wrote that he had learned to be happy even when he did not have all the things he needed or when he did not have enough to eat. What do you think Paul's secret was? How could he be happy even in bad times? He wrote, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul thought about what God wanted him to do, not what Paul wanted to have. He believed that Jesus Christ gave him strength to face any troubles or problems that he might face. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the good news of great joy that the angels brought us long ago. Thank you for Jesus, who teaches us how to love one another. Help us to be filled with joy as we love and as we feel peaceful with God's strength. Help us to spread that joy to others, even when we have reason to be sad. Thank you for always being near to us. Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit of God, shine your light upon this world 
and upon this word and into our hearts that we may be enlightened with fresh understanding. Amen. Our epistle reading today is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We have been going through the book of Philippians and studying how Paul uh, argues, uh, well, not really argues, but talks to the Philippians uh, as he encourages them to love one another and to be a strong, faithful, and Christian community. So today we will study the last selection of his letter that he writes to them. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Rodia and I urge Sintith to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So ends the reading from Philippians. Our gospel reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, when Jesus has been speaking to the Pharisees in parables. He continues giving them various parables to study the kingdom of heaven by. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat cows have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm and another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all who they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noted a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? 
and he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. I've heard it before, but often when it is said, it seems meaningless. A friend tells a friend not to worry when someone close to them dies, or when they lost a job, or when something very expensive and necessary is lost or damaged, like a car, for instance. It seems like it is one of the only reasonable things to say to care for the other, but it does not sink in. It is understandable to be filled with worry in these instances, immediately worry about finances or the whole that is created in one's life comes to mind. How then are we to rejoice in the Lord always, as Paul tells the Philippians to do? Certainly we are not meant to rejoice when we are let down by something in this life and when we are trying to just put together all those broken pieces of our lives. Job lost his livestock, his land and his servants and his children all in one day. That was a very bad day for him. Satan expected it would cause him to curse God to roll over and die, but that is not what Job did. Instead, he prayed, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The one thing that could not be taken away from him was his faith in God. His friends and his wife continued to try to convince him that his faith was not worth it, was not worth continuing to fight for. But to him, to Job, it was worth it, right to the last chapter of the book. He said to the Lord in Job 42, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He still managed to rejoice in the Lord, and his fortune was restored to him twofold. I have spent the last few weeks trying to see if I can get out of my apartment in Ashland in order to move closer to the church. I would love to be able to cut down on the drive and be able to come to the church without feeling like I need to make a day trip, an hour drive out of it. I was offered a place that would have been good for me and a step up from where I live now. The only thing that I needed was for someone to take over my apartment. After cycling through six candidates with no leads, it was time last week for the landlord who had offered his place to me to move on and list the place so that he was not losing money with no rent coming in. We both knew that we would reach a point where we had to stop waiting for someone successful to take my apartment from me. Due to no further leads on my current apartment, we had to call off the search. Both the prospective landlord and I were disappointed, but he noted something that is meaningful to me. He said to me that this week, Paul tells us to rejoice always. We should, even when we are disappointed, we should still seek to rejoice in and with God. Throughout our study of Philippians, we have seen how Paul has suffered through his ministry. He has not been able to see his friends as often as he would like to. 
because he is either too far to travel to them or he is stuck in prison. Conditions are not the best for him, to say the least, but he still encourages his friends writing from prison that they should always seek to rejoice in the Lord. He argues that it is not worth it to worry about anything because we can send our worries as prayers to God. God will hear them and respond to them by sending the peace of God to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If there is one theme of this letter to this point, attaining a, of a mind of Christ has been one that I have noticed. If simply sending our worries to God as prayers gives us that peace with God, and that mind of Jesus. I want to learn how to send our worries faithfully to God. That is, how can we trust that God will take care of our worries when we send them? How does praying help to alleviate the worry? It is alleviated because we trust that God will handle it that God will help us to make it through no matter what suffering we face today. We can trust God because of the peace that we have been given following other worries or from hearing the testimonies of others. Ernest Scott wrote an extensive review of what he thought the purpose for Paul's letter to the Philippians might be. After Paul does thank the Philippians, Although Paul does thank the Philippians for a gift that they had sent him in prison, Scott believes that a previous thank you was made and that this was not the primary purpose of the letter. He writes, While Paul thanks the Philippians, he is also concerned about them. He implores them in this message, which he feared with good reason might be his last, to rise above all littleness and doubt and self-complacency. He tells them what Christ has done for him and is now doing as he lies in prison. By their kindness and sympathy, they have shared in his suffering, and he seeks to impart to them something of the grace which has sustained him. Paul wants to pass on that grace that he feels even when he is suffering in prison so that the Philippians can make it through by having faith in God and by sharing in that faith that Paul had in prison. Paul is worried for the Philippians and he prays for them. He wants them to know what has worked for him. He focuses over and over again on reforming their Christian spirit, on telling them how to attain a mind like Jesus so that they can feel the peace that he feels, even while in prison. When I read this letter, I can feel the emotion that Paul pours into his words. He calls them beloved. He cares deeply for them. He asks them to do whatever is honorable, whatever is just, and whatever is pure. He tells them to think of what is worthy of praise rather than what is worthy of sorrow. He implores them to keep on doing the things they have learned and received and seen in Paul. If they do these things, Paul says, the God of peace will be with them. We can imagine that Paul will be talking to us when we read this letter as though we are the Philippians. We have kept the path, but we are often tempted to think about that which gives us sorrow. We are tempted to become lost in worry. These things just distract us from experiencing the peace of God. We have heard all these things before, just as the Philippians had. But Paul wanted to tell them, and he would like to tell us today, that if we remember this one thing from his ministry, remember this. 
to experience the peace of God and know the mind of Christ. Press on in our faith, never give up, and focus on the things that we can praise God for, that we can rejoice in, and model that rejoicing for others. God will handle the rest if we only let God. For again, as Paul said, the God of peace will be with them. First, rejoice always. Even when life is disappointing, try to find something to praise God about. It will help you focus on God in the time when you need God most. When so much else usually distracts you from God, when rejoicing is too difficult, take a moment to pray and give your worries over to God. Second, when you focus on God, it will be easier to guard your hearts and minds, to put on the mind of Jesus, and to experience that peace of God. You are probably thinking right now that it is easier said than done. I completely understand that. I believe that Paul understood that as well. That is why he said to press on. He wrote, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. I do not think there is one moment where we say or notice that we have put on the mind of Christ. We are on a journey. We have rises and falls, times when we are tempted, and times when we bring ourselves back to focus on God. God knows this. Paul knows this. When we feel like we are falling short, the best thing that we can do is pray. Before I knew to pray regularly, falling short was a worry for me. But prayer deals with worries. When we talk with God, we can hand our worries over to God. That is the first step in putting on the mind of Christ and experiencing the peace of God. Just as Paul wanted to leave the Philippians with this in mind, Paul want us to keep it in mind too today. More than that, we should act on it. Paul modeled what he could to be an example for those he taught. Our task as Christians, once we feel the peace of God, will be to model it and teach others in order to pass it on as Paul did. But take it one step at a time. First, pray. When in doubt, Pray, pray, and rejoice. Nathan Eddy emphasized that Paul's joy was only complete when his congregation was joyful and shared their faith with the community. Paul called the Philippians to, in his words, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. To be joyful himself, Paul wanted to hear good things from the churches that he had been to. He wanted to know that they were following what he had taught them and spreading the gospel by their good works. He praised God whenever he heard good news from the churches that he had taught. Eddie relates Paul to the feelings of pastors today. He writes, Preachers share in rejoicing in the Lord. They are not the source of it. Preaching in a way that elicits joy begins in the recognition that the preacher's joy is intertwined with the congregations in the unfolding drama that God is working in the lives of all through the unlikeliest of people and circumstances. In other words, Preachers' joys are complete when they see their congregation doing God's work, following the words that they say to them, trying to be good servants of God. 
They care enough to express unlimited patience and love, just as Paul did. When I see things work out for God's glory, I am overjoyed. It is what gives me energy. Seeing people work together, loving one another, feeding each other with meals, and worshiping God together is heartwarming. Not for my own cause, but because I know that God is being glorified through it. God is glorified and we help each other to put on the minds of Christ and to experience the peace of God when we pray for one another and when we serve one another. These acts of love that glorify God is the primary reason that Paul gave thanks for people like the Philippians. He had heard that good news and he wanted to share some additional guidance, especially in case he could not see them again. Paul often repeats himself. In chapter 3, he called on the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 2, he tells them that they must also be glad and rejoice with him. I continually pray that you may all experience peace in God so that you do not have distractions that keep you from rejoicing. I pray for this not only in our church, but in the wider church community and for the global church. We are all here to support each other on the journey as we press on, seeking God, praying, serving one another, and rejoicing as God is glorified in our minds, in our words, and in our actions. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, found in our red books, number 13. We can rejoice as we sing this song and think about how Paul called us to be rejoicing in the Lord. <laughs>
God invites us to invest our time and resources in ways that build rather than destroy, in work of lasting value rather than temporary distraction. Through the church, we seek to offer a quality of life focused on the worth of every individual, on justice for all, and excellence in all things. May our offerings and our lives praise God this morning. Our offerings are currently uh, being either mailed to the church or when you come in, you can place your offering in the offering plates in the rear of the sanctuary or at the top of the stairs. And we thank you for continuing to give your offerings and understanding the need of the church during this time. Let us sing our responsive praise together. generosity reflect the amazing abundance you entrust to our care. As we find joy in giving, may others be inspired to give their best, and may all of us realize your peace dwelling within and among us as we serve in Christ's name. Amen. have a few uh, joys and concerns this morning. Uh, first, the joy and concern is that harvest has started and many of our farmers are busy uh, harvesting their fields. And uh, I did have the opportunity a couple weeks ago to join in on that with uh, Bob Ryan and uh, see some of the harvesting and get to realize the farming life a little bit. Uh, in some small way, and that was a joy to me to be able to share in that. And we also pray for the farmers to remain safe during the harvest and to all well, stay <coughs> sane and be well in the busyness that the harvest brings to their lives amid whatever other lives they lead. So we hold them in prayer this morning as well. We also continue to pray for the people in California who continue, and, and not just in California, but out west, who continue to face the wildfires and the condition, the poor air quality out there. We continue to uh, remember and pray for them. I'd also like to pray for uh, Robbie Weller, who passed this past week, uh, related to our member Olive Weller, and definitely pray for uh, the family and friends of Robbie Weller, uh, who passed pretty unexpectedly during surgery uh, this past week. He was only in his early 60s, so we pray for his family in that loss. And they also pray for J the family and friends of Janet Hayward. Uh, Janet was a member of our church, and she passed on Thursday at the age of 87 in her home in Republic. We certainly pray for her family and friends as well. And lastly, I would like to pray for the family and friends of Faye, who is my uh, fiance's grandmother, who passed away on Friday. So I'd like to continue to uh, pray for um, my fiance and her family in the loss of her grandmother, Faye. Let us pray this morning. Lord, your mercy reaches to the heavens. Your goodness knows no end. 
let your love and peace be known among us, that we may draw others to worship you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give thanks for our faith and pray for all those who struggle in the work of the gospel, for those who preach the word and administer the sacraments. We pray for a gentleness and graciousness in our mission and outreach. We remember those who work among the outcasts and the poor. We pray for all who strive to bring in your peace and for those who also strive to bring in your harvest for our farmers and for the workers of your kingdom who reap the gain of faith and the harvest that is our faith. We pray for all troubled areas of your world, that wars may cease, and that we may find a lasting peace. We pray for the peacemakers of our world. We remember all who have suffered through war, all who have been injured, and all who have lost loved ones. We pray for those whose memories are scarred by violence. We pray that our homes may be places of peace and healing. We pray for all those who are suffering from broken relationships. We pray for reconciliation and healing where peoples are divided so that we may live at peace with all people. We pray for all those who are distressed, for the over-anxious and the fearful, for the troubled in body, mind, or spirit, for all those who are over-tense or upright, for all those who find it hard to relax or let go. We pray for all those whose peace is disturbed by the violence or carelessness of others. Lord, Help them to put on the mind of Christ, to pray to you. And Lord, by your power and your presence, provide us with peace. We pray specifically for those who we know are in need of your healing and peace. We pray for Bill Carroll, Shirley Dick, Jim Good Sr., Mike Hamer, Jay Jackson, Calvin Kegley, Yvonne Montoya, Annie Naylor, Jack Ryan, Dorothy Shirk, Bob Wollenslegel, Viola Ziegler, and Ross Gordon, who went to the ER this week due to complications, we pray for his recovery as well. We also pray for our president, Donald Trump, for healing from the coronavirus, continue to make sure that he remains healthy. We also pray for the family and friends of those who have recently died. We pray for the family and friends of Robbie Weller, the family and friends of Janet Hayward, and the family and friends of my fiancé's grandmother, Faye. May we share with them in the peace of your everlasting kingdom. As we seek your peace, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of parting today is Lord dismiss us with thy blessing, found in our purple hymnals 373. <laughs> Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.